Well, I'm glad you didn't clap there. <laughs> well, brothers and sisters, um, I'd like to begin this morning with a, a little bit of an apology. I hope we didn't drive the chariot too furiously yesterday to run the wheels off it. It is uh, a bit of a chore to fit the subject material into 45 minutes, and um, we hope this morning to try and, and uh, pace it out a little bit better, and um, hopefully uh, we've called out some of the material just to help it digest a little easier. That's why there are the notes. Um, there are more copies that are being made for those who didn't get any, um, so be patient and they will arrive. So um, this morning, then, brothers and sisters, we are going to look at the cherubim as it's revealed to us in the tabernacle and in the temple. It's the cherubim under the law. We actually probably won't get time to reach the temple, but most of what we look at in the tabernacle is covered under the same area. Our goal is to see how the vehicles of God's will are commissioned in the life of the nation of Israel. See where they were, the characteristics they displayed and hopefully be challenged to adopt some of the characteristics or the meanings as they are displayed to us under the law. We'd like to begin to frame this subject this morning, sort of like we did yesterday, and just look at God's purpose for a moment with Israel. We see in Acts chapter 15 and verse 14 that God separated, he took out of the Gentiles a people for his name. That was his purpose with this nation. And he began, of course, with Abraham, when he told Abraham in Genesis 12 to get thee out of thy country and from thy people and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation. And of course, Israel's name was changed or Jacob's name was changed from just Jacob, the supplanter, to the ruler with God. So we see that Israel was removed from their, their home base, I guess you could say, originally Ur of the Chaldees in their father Abraham to the land, and eventually from Egypt, as Jacob had gone down there to sojourn with his family, to the land. And so on that journey, they take on the characteristic of the cherubim. God says of Israel in Exodus 6, verse 6, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians... I will redeem you, he says, and he goes on to say, I will take you to me for a people, and I will bring you unto the land. So we have God then removing Israel from their circumstances, separating them out, and bringing them towards this land. And it's interesting because he says, Thou shalt bring them and plant them in the mount of thine inheritance, in the place, O Yahweh, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The word there for plant, funnily enough, is the same word for pitched, as the idea of pitching a garden or planting a garden eastward in Eden. So we see that the canvas that was initially set, we now have a new canvas that has been created where God will endeavor to bring about his purpose of fulfilling or filling the earth with those who manifest his character or his glory. The nation of Israel then was planted in the wilderness in a specific formation. In Numbers chapter 2, if you'd like to turn to Numbers chapter 2, it's going to form the basis or one of the home bases for our, our conversation uh, this morning. Numbers chapter 2, we have here in verse 2 the setting up of the tribes in their formations. Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard or his banner with the ensign of their father's house. So Israel was separated out by threes, four groupings of three. The tribes were organized under the military banners, and one of the tribe was, was head over each of the three. And they camped under these banners. They're positioned on each of the sides of the tabernacle. Now, brothers and sisters, there's not a specific verse which outlines the banners that tells us exactly what they are. Jewish tradition, which is borne out, I believe, by the logic of the scriptures, follows the same pattern of the cherubim as it's revealed in Ezekiel and elsewhere. What we do know, brothers and sisters, is what the record states for us. And as we go through the different tribes and we look at their setup, we're going to follow the banners. Now, this is sort of preliminary to our classes as we come into Ezekiel and, and into Daniel and into the book of Revelation to help us sort of get some of those symbols under our belts to understand them before we even get there. 
So we begin then with the standard of Judah. Judah in verse 3, we're told that it's on the east side. Notice the phrasing here, toward the rising of the sun. And that little phrase will come up elsewhere, as we'll see. In fact, you may think of it already with the book of Revelation in chapter 16. And their standard, or they are the standard of the camp of Judah, will pitch throughout their army. So they're depicted in a military encampment, and they have the standard pitched towards the sun. Well, the standard of Judah, of course, is the standard of the lion. We read in Numbers chapter 24 that this is a representative representative standard. It actually stands for the whole nation. We read, How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. And he goes on to say, He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and curseth he that curseth thee. So we see here that the lion, although it is the standard of Judah, represents the whole nation. In fact, we see this in all the faces of the cherubim. There are different aspects with different characteristics, but the nation as a whole takes on all of them. Just like brothers and sisters, there are many of us with different roles, but all of us must take on the characteristics of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it is connected then with the idea of the whole nation, of the blessings, of course, of Abraham are tied right into that passage. In fact, it's a symbol also of judgment. So the lion face represents also the idea of the judgments of God. Specifically, Israel in judgment, looking to the future, Micah chapter 5 and verse 8, the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. So it certainly is a picture of judgment. The nation of Israel will manifest in the time to come. When they are gathered out of the nations under the hand of Elijah, they come as a lion, as the remnant that is amongst the flock, and they basically tear any of those nations who will stand against them. Of course, the one we know perhaps the best is the symbol of the king, because when the blessings were given, the promises by Jacob, or the blessings by Jacob to his sons, he said in Genesis chapter 49, verse 9, that Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor nor the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering, or the gathering of the people be. So it becomes then a symbol of the royalty of the house of David, the tribe of Judah. And of course, this is picked up in the book of Revelation, where we read about the lion of the tribe of Judah who would open the book. And so we uh, will look at that in a later class. But suffice it to say that the, the face of the cherubim, which is the lion, is one of rulership. But there are other aspects to it as well, brothers and sisters, and one of which is it is the voice of of prophecy. The lion is equated with this. In Amos chapter 3 and verses 7 and 8, we read, Surely the Lord Yahweh will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord Yahweh hath spoken, who can but prophesy? So the voice of prophecy is likened to the roar of the lion. And of course, this makes perfect sense because it's the lion of the tribe of Judah that opens the book. We find in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 3, when the rainbow angel cries out, his voice is as a lion roareth. So this royalty has to do also with the prophecy that would be given. It's also used by God as a symbol of the Gentiles. Gentiles who come in judgment. They become vehicles of his will that he uses, in this case, against the nation of Israel. We have two passages here, well, there's several passages, but Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 7, we read that the lion has come up from his thicket. The destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate. We read also in Jeremiah 50 that there were two of the lions. Israel is a scattered sheep. 
The lions have driven him away. First, this king of Assyria hath devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. So, Jeremiah 50, verse 17. Ironic, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that the lion is a symbol of Israel amongst the Gentiles, scattering them like a flock. But if they choose not to walk with God, be directed by him, then he sends other vehicles of his will who will be like lions to scatter Israel. And so we see the character of our God, brothers and sisters, that as the Lord says, he who is not with me is against me. And so we have a choice of which of the faces of the cherubim we manifest and consequently on which of the faces of God we see. We now come, brothers and sisters, to the next of the tribes, the standard of Reuben. Well, a brief summary. I uh, just added this in. That's why I'm jumping ahead. But um, the, uh, the brief summary is that the lion is used to represent the nation of Israel. It's the specific standard of Judah. It is the symbol of the king, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is used of Israel in the wilderness and Israel in the age to come. It represents the voice of prophecy. It is a symbol of judgment and sometimes, of course, the nations who would judge Israel. So coming along then to Reuben, we find that he was camped on the south side. And the standard or the banner of the camp of Reuben, according to their armies, was to be put there. Numbers chapter 2 and verse 10. Reuben, of course, is represented by the man. He was the firstborn of Jacob. And so when we consider this, this idea of the face of a man that appears on the cherubim, we say, well, what does that represent to us? Well, of course, there's several things it represents. Again, it represents the multitudinous son, the nation of Israel. When Moses said to Pharaoh, or related the words of God to Pharaoh, in Exodus 4, verse 22, he says, Thus saith Yahweh, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And so he asked Pharaoh to let his people go. And we think of the way it's used of the nation of Israel, how Ezra describes them as being gathered together as one man in Jerusalem. So this idea then of the man is not just a single individual man per se, but it's of a group, a host. It's focused in one man, of course, and that is the Son of Man, who is prophesied in, prophesied in Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 12. Thus say, speaketh Yahweh of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall grow out of his place and shall build the temple of Yahweh. And we have in John chapter 19, verse 5, the words of Pilate quoting this, Behold the man. So the man is a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, as we've mentioned, the cherubim is not an individual figure. It is a multitudinous one, the multitudinous Christ. So when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not just one son of man, but there are many involved with him. We read in John chapter, or first epistle of John chapter 3 and verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. So we have then this multitudinous aspect, both in the nation and in the ecclesia, who are tied into that multitudinous Christ. We think, of course, of the words of John chapter 1 and verse 12 that he tells us that as many as received the Lord Jesus Christ, to them he became, gave power to become sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. And notice what he says in Romans chapter 8, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So the earnest man expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of, the revealing of the sons of God. So when we look at the cherubim and we see the face of the man, it is certainly a depiction of the Lord Jesus Christ, as is the lion. But it's not individually him. It's him as represented in a multitude. There is a group who are tied in with him. We come to Daniel chapter 7. We're not going to spend too much time with this, but we find in the night visions 
one like the Son of Man, who came with clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Here again we see a picture of one like the Son of Man. It is the multitudinous Christ, once again, as they are brought before the Lord Jesus Christ, seated on his throne. And we will see this uh, in a future class. And so we have the picture then that's given to us also in the book of Revelation. Chapter 1 and verse 13, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, again, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot. And we don't have time to go through this whole picture, but we do pick out here certain Carabic Uh, characteristics. His eyes was a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass. These pictures come up for us in Ezekiel. He has a voice, as the sound of many waters, which is many peoples, it's multitudinous, and his countenance is as the sun shining in his strength. Think of the words of Matthew chapter 14, verse 43, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And so we have the man which is the symbol, of course, of Reuben, Judah's firstborn son. It's a symbol of flesh, but not just flesh. It's God manifest in the flesh. A man that represents the nation of Israel, God's national son. A man that is the title of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son. And the saints who are described as being sons of God, or one like the Son of Man, the multitudinous Christ. This is a picture of those people who God uses to carry his name amongst the Gentiles. And now, brothers and sisters, we come to the picture of the standard of Ephraim. Ephraim, it says in Numbers chapter 2 and verse 10, was on the west side. And his standard of the camp of Ephraim, according to their armies, the west side was the banner to be planted, which was the standard of Ephraim. And this, of course, brothers and sisters, would be the standard of the ox. And incidentally, when you look at that picture there, the east is the lion and the west is the ox. So it's not located north, south, east, west. It's done according to how this is actually uh, camped out. The symbol then of the ox. Once again, it's a symbol that's used of the nation of Israel. And this is one of those things that I guess I've just missed for many years, but it really came out strong when looking at these. First of Kings chapter 7, verse 25, when Solomon mounted the brazen sea, it stood upon 12 oxen, and they looked towards the north, the west, the south, and the east. And that was a depiction of the nation of Israel, 12 of them representing the 12 tribes. It's the symbol, brothers and sisters, that's probably the easiest for us to identify with, or perhaps second after the lion, and that is of the laborer. The ox is a symbol of labor. Ox bear the yoke. We have in 1 Timothy chapter 5, in verse 18, the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. The laborer is worthy of his hire. So the ox is the laborer. And we think, of course, of the Lord Jesus Christ who invites us to take on this characteristic. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. So the Lord asks us to join him in this characteristic of being oxen, of being laborers. We come to Psalm 69. We find it's a symbol of thanksgiving and praise. It's one of these sort of parable psalms where you have two things that are put side by side. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please Yahweh better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hoofs. The humble shall see this and be glad. Your heart shall live that seek God." So we have here the idea of the two things put side by side. Praise and thanksgiving being compared with the oxen. No no different than we have your faith being better than that of tried gold. And so when we look at that, the humility aspect and thanksgiving, we think of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we're told in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who took upon him, it says, the form of a servant, and he humbled himself 
and became obedient unto death. So this is a characteristic, brothers and sisters, of work in the truth, of mounting ourselves under that yoke to pull with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the yoke is easy and the burden is light if we would put our necks to that work. It's interesting, though, brothers and sisters, as well, that the oxen, like all of the aspects of the cherubim, has a dual meaning. The other side to it is one of judgment. You think of Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 4, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. This is the passage that's quoted in Timothy about the laborer being worthy of his hire. You say, okay, well, the ox is laboring, but what exactly was he doing? He was treading the corn. Well, what is treading the corn, brothers and sisters, but threshing? And so we have the picture painted for us in Micah chapter 4 of the nation of Israel, the daughter of Zion. He says, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto Yahweh and their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. So the oxen, although it is the laborer, the humble, meek laborer, is also going to be used by God as a vehicle of his will in the kingdom age to tread out the nations, to thrash them, and to beat many, pieces, many peoples into pieces. And that, of course, takes our minds to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, where the kingdom will grow and fill the entire earth. The picture of that little stone that crushes and breaks in pieces that great image and grinds it to powder like chaff on the summer threshing floor. And so the nation of Israel will be used for that purpose as a vehicle of his will in the time to come. Looking at the ox then, it's used to represent the nation of Israel. It's a symbol of the laborer. It's a symbol of humility and thankfulness. The Lord Jesus Christ is one who took up on the form of a servant, the ox, and asks us to do the same in taking his yoke upon us, and is used of Israel in the age to come in judgment of the nations. Well, now we come, brothers and sisters, to the tribe of Dan. Their standard or the banner of Dan that was planted on the north side and the tribes that were associated with him. Here we have, brothers and sisters, in this, the face of the eagle. And we think of the words of the Lord to Moses, of Yahweh to Moses, in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 4. It's a symbol of divine protection. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. And so this is a symbol of God lifting Israel up and bearing him upon his wings and bringing him to himself. We'll spend more time, brothers and sisters, looking at this in a later class. We're not going to spend a lot of time on the eagle right now. We're going to look at it when we look at the, the symbols further on. But it's a symbol, brothers and sisters, of the judgments of Yahweh. Jeremiah chapter 48 and verse 40, For thus saith Yahweh, Behold, he shall fly as an eagle, and shall spread his wings over Moab, coming in judgment. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 49, speaking of the nation of Israel, Yahweh shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, whose tongue thou shalt not understand. And again, brothers and sisters, it's ironic, is it not? That God says, I brought you out of Egypt, and I bear you on eagles' wings the protection of Yahweh to us. But if we will not have that protection, then he sends the eagles to scatter us. We read of Matthew chapter 24 and 28, wheresoever the carcass is, there are the eagles gathered together. And so we have that choice as to which of the faces we will be looking at. It's also a symbol, though, brothers and sisters, of spirit nature. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31, They that wait upon Yahweh shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and shall not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And it's a beautiful picture. The idea of being mounted up like wings, with wings like eagles. Of course, the eagle rides upon the ruach, upon the spirit, 
So this is the idea of being lifted up in nature, to ride upon the spirit. No more flesh and blood, which cannot inherit the kingdom. No more beset about with the weaknesses of the flesh, both physical, mental, and moral. But these things being removed and having the strength to fly as the eagles. Think of the words of David. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, that I might fly, fly away. And the time will come, brothers and sisters, when we will be given those wings not the literal wings, of course, but the symbolic wings to be able to rise above this nature. And our strength will be renewed like the eagles, as it says in Psalm 103 and verse 5. And we'll come back and consider the eagle in greater length later on. But we have from Brother Purse Mansfield, who I, I must say, it was the first talk I ever heard on the cherubim was Uncle Purse. And if you think I talk fast, I can tell you something. You've not seen anything. We used to say of Uncle Purse, if you didn't get a cramp writing during his classes, it wasn't probably worth listening to, because he went like a machine gun. But he, uh, he put this together, and it sort of stuck with me for many years. It's the parable of the standards of Israel, the parable of the faces of the cherubim. If we would rule as the lion, we must first serve as the ox. If we desire spirit nature as the eagle... We must first manifest it, the spirit that is, in our flesh, which is, of course, the man. And so we see that these standards that were around Israel had their representations, but with them a great lesson. To rule, we must first serve. To be given spirit nature, we must first manifest that spirit in our flesh. Which spirit, says Paul, will change our mortal bodies in that day? And so, brothers and sisters, we have then this picture of Israel. There they are. They're in the wilderness. There are four standards around them. They're the four heads of the cherubim. It's yet to be fully revealed. When we come to Ezekiel, we'll see it as a greater thing. But these are the shadows that are pointing forward to the future. These are the things, the indications of what is coming. So they help us understand them. Before we get to what's in Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation, those things are the, the antitypes, so to speak. These are the things pointing forward. So the nation of Israel is the cherubim in a manifestation in the wilderness. They were a vehicle of God's will. And you see this fully, brothers and sisters, when you consider how they moved around. We think of the cherubim just jumping ahead to Ezekiel. It says, wherever the head looked, they went. It also says, wherever the spirit was to go, they went. And we read of Israel in Numbers chapter 9 and verse 17. When the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that, the children of Israel journeyed. They went. And in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of Yahweh, the children of Israel journeyed. And at the commandment of Yahweh, they pitched. And so we see, brothers and sisters, that they are the cherubim. Wherever the spirit was to go, they went. And they carried those four faces with them. And they represented God to the nations around them. They were a vehicle of his will. They were ridden by the majesty, by the deity and he dwelt among them. Let them make me a sanctuary, he says in Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9, that I may dwell among them. And we think, brothers and sisters, of the definition we looked at yesterday of the parable, or of the, the meaning of the cherubim, the contextual definition, that God would inhabit the cherubim. He would dwell among them. Well, here he says that he would dwell among and he would inhabit the nation of Israel. And so we come, brothers and sisters, then to that tabernacle that was in the midst of the nation. At the center of Israel's camp was the tabernacle. He was to dwell in the middle of them. At the center of the tabernacle, brothers and sisters, was the ark. At the center of the ark was the word of God. We have the picture that this is what God puts at the center of everything. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 10, Thou shalt make an ark of shittim wood, or kea wood, verse 10. And he goes on to say in verse 16, Thou shalt put into the ark the testimony that I shall give thee. So there are the cherubim above the ark, 
and they're over top of the testimony that God would give them. And this is at the very center of the nation of Israel. What should that say, brothers and sisters, about our ecclesial life? What needs to be at the absolute core essence and center of who we are? The Word of God. And if we ever lose that, brothers and sisters, we no longer are a vehicle of God's will. We no longer manifest the deity. We are just simply a group of people, as Israel became. A carcass without the spirit. And along came the eagles, the vehicles of his will, and scattered that carcass across the Roman Empire. If we lose the ability to do the Bible reading as his families, if we, if we lose the ability to study the word together in our ecclesias, to have meaningful Bible classes, not just social get-togethers, but where we pour over the Word of God to find out the wondrous things that are written in that book, to pray for them to be revealed to us, and expend our time and effort to find out what they are. If we lose this character, brothers and sisters, we are the corpse the Lord describes as in Matthew. And he says, except thou repent, I will come and take thy candlestick, thy lampstand, away from thee. It's a great exhortation as to what we need to be about as a people. And I'll say, brothers and sisters, clearly we are, as a community, losing that. And I'm sure you can attest to it in your own family life, trying to find the time to do the readings. A simple practice of our community over generations. And yet today, many run to and fro, but it's not to do the things of the deity. The truth is something that's not at the center of our lives at times. It's what is stuffed in around the edges where we can fit it in. And we need to repolarize ourselves and say, why were we called out of the nations? Why were you and I separated from many people? Why were we called to walk through the land, through the breadth of it and the length of it? It was to manifest our God, which we can only do, brothers and sisters, if we know his ways and his word. So there at the center of Israel was that word. We read in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 to 23, My son, keep thy father's commandments. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thy heart. Tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. When thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and the reproof of instructions are the way of life. The word, brothers and sisters, is the way to the tree of life that the cherubim were keeping in the ark, in the temp tabernacle, in the center of the nation of Israel. It was the lamp to lead them, the light to lighten their path, to direct them on that way of life. And clearly, brothers and sisters, we see the connection to the cherubim and the way of the tree of life when we look at the ark. There are the cherubim, they're guarding over, they're presiding over the law that would lead them to the way of the tree of life. It's no surprise that that's where we find them in the tabernacle. And so we read in Exodus chapter 30, verse 6, Thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat which is over the testimony. There will I meet with thee. Where did God meet with Cain and Abel? They came before his faces. You can begin to see how this thread ties together, don't you, brothers and sisters? Just like Eden... Here was God at the center of Israel, and the cherubim were there guarding over it. That was the function of the ark. The word mercy seat, of course, or is the covering. It's the word caporet, which basically means to cover. It's used only of the ark of the covenant, the most inner recess of the temple where the ark of the covenant was placed. It simply is, brothers and sisters, the lid that covered But, of course, it has a greater meaning than that. Come, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 3. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 3. We have here 
the picture that Paul draws upon. It's, it's picking up on this language of the cherubim. Because, of course, the cherubim is a symbolic creature that has meaning. We read in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 3, after the second veil, so the first veil would bring you into the holy place, the second veil is the holiest of all, the most holy, which had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, the tables of the covenant, and over the cherubims, or over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we now cannot speak particularly. So here we have the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. And if you're like me, brothers and sisters, the word mercy seat, when you look it up, is the word propitiation. I'd have a job spelling it, let alone knowing what it meant. It's sort of one of those words, it's sort of like, you know, immediately when somebody says propitiation, you know, this is something I'm perhaps not supposed to understand. But the word propitiation is not something that should be shrouded in mystery. It is simply the word for the mercy seat. It is the covering. And when we use that definition, it becomes much clearer. We shouldn't be scared off by it. Come to 1st of John chapter 2, just over a few pages, because if we plug this definition in and we see now what the cherubim were, they were the covering over, protecting the way. We find in 1st of John chapter 2... And verse 1, John says, My little children, if these, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Of course, our brother Roger will be dealing with this. The Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation. There's that word. The covering for our sins. And not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Simply put, brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus Christ is the mercy seat. He is the covering. He is the cherubim that overshadow. He is the one that protects the way. He keeps the way to the tree of life. When we look at that ark and we look at the mercy seat and we look at the cherubim, the covering over the word of God, protecting the way, we see the Lord Jesus Christ. Coming back then to Exodus, chapter 37, he made the mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half was the length thereof, one cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and he made two cherubims of gold. Beaten out of one piece, he made them the two ends of the mercy seat. So once again, it's not one cherub. It's cherubim. It is the plural. There's no need for an S on the end of it. Cherubim is the plural. So it's not just the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a representative picture of the multitudinous Christ. Now, get it clear, brothers and sisters, none of us would be there without him. So this isn't the saints without Christ. This is Christ as the head of the body, as the head of the saints. This is what is depicted. And so we have this picture in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 18, that the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. They face each other, brothers and sisters, and they're facing that mercy seat. Just a quick little thought here. We think of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, that we are to be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We are to look to the mercy seat. But they also looked one to another. And we read, brothers and sisters, that look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. In Philippians 2 verse 4, and we're told in Matthew that we are to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbor as ourself. So we see these creatures whose focus is not upon themselves, but upon their Lord and upon their brothers and sisters. So in quick summary then, brothers and sisters, the cherubim on the mercy seat. They were part of the covering of the ark, the mercy seat. They're part of the lid. They protected the testimony or the covenant that would keep Israel in the way as they traveled through the wilderness wandering. The Lord Jesus Christ is the mercy seat. The cherubim that are on it are symbolic of the multitudinous Christ, of Christ first and then of his saints with him. 
Their focus is first on their Lord and then upon their brethren. And so we have here at the center of Israel a very similar picture to what was in Genesis. And God says in chapter 25, verse 22, There will I meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the top or upon the ark of the testimony of all the things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So this was the place of communication, just like the cherubim would have been the place of communication back in the Garden of Eden. This is where God spoke to Israel from. It is, brothers and sisters, a picture of the throne of God. Second Samuel chapter 6 and verse 2, David, speaking of the ark, says, When he arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of Yahweh of hosts, that dwelleth between the cherubim. The word there, dwelleth, is the word yeshab, which means to sit to sit down, to be set, to remain, to stay, to dwell, to have one's abode, to inhabit. God was enthroned in this place. He was enthroned upon the cherubim. In fact, the Psalms put it quite clearly when we read there in Psalm 99 and verse 1, Yahweh reigneth, let the people tremble, he sitteth, between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. Psalm 80, verse 1, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that ledest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. And that little phrase, brothers and sisters, is God is on his throne, in symbol, shine forth, takes us right back to Genesis. How was the offering accepted? There was respect given. How did God show that acceptance? A bolt of lightning went out and devoured the sacrifice. A flame of fire came down from heaven in the days of Elijah and devoured the sacrifice. He shone forth and showed his acceptance. And so the prayer of the psalmist is, Thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. And that, brothers and sisters, needs to be our prayer when it comes to our God. And so in summary, brothers and sisters, the cherubim were the focal point where God would appear to Israel in a cloud. God would communicate with Israel from between the cherubim, just like Eden. God inhabited the cherubim. He dwelt there. This was his symbolic throne in the midst of the nation of Israel, for a place from which he would shine forth and indicate his acceptance. And so, brothers and sisters, we have then this great picture that's given to us of God's interaction with us. Now, we only have time to look at one other detail of the cherubim under the law, and there are others. Exodus chapter 26, and at verse 31, we read that they're on the veil. Thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen with cunning work, and with cherubim shall it be made, and it's to be hung. So this is the veil that hangs between the testimony, the Ark of the Testimony, and the holy place. It's described in chapter 26 and verse 32 to verse 33. Thou shalt hang upon it, or upon the veil, under the taches, that thou may bring thither within the veil the Ark of the Testimony. What was the veil for? It was to divide between the holy place and the most holy So the veil stood as a barrier between man and God. What does the veil represent, brothers and sisters? Well, it's got the cherubim upon it. So God is somehow in this thing. Come to Hebrews chapter 10. Just turn in your Bibles over to see this. Hebrews chapter 10. We have there in verse 19 the Apostle Paul who speaks to us of this very thing. He says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So here we are going into the most holy place by a new and living way, the way to the tree of life, which he hath consecrated for us 
through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So what, brothers and sisters, stands between us and our God? Flesh. But this flesh, brothers and sisters, was just not any flesh. It had the cherubim embroidered upon it. It was God manifest in the flesh. What happened, brothers and sisters, to that flesh? When the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, that veil was rent from the top to the bottom. And the way was opened for us to enter in. Flesh had to die in order for them to enter into the way to the tree of life. And the cherubim, the Lord Jesus Christ, was the keeper of that way. And the way in which we can enter into covenant relationship and consequently be partakers of that tree of life, brothers and sisters, is by the death of flesh. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so it had to be put to death. And the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated it, even though he was God manifest in the flesh. What was manifest partly was that flesh deserves to die. And he put it to death, opening the way, removing the barrier between us and God. If we would associate with him, if we also would be cherubim, vehicles of his will, and demonstrate the same principle in our lives. And so the cherubim on the veil represent God manifest in the flesh. The entrance to the most holy place requires the veil to be rent or put to death. And the living way was opened at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ when that veil was rent by the work of our God, God reconciling the world to himself by his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have the cherubim then, brothers and sisters, a picture of God manifest in the flesh in the nation of Israel, that they, he dwelt in the midst of them, that they moved at his command, that they carried those characteristics. And we have the warning to us, brothers and sisters, that each of those faces has a dual meaning. And it's up to us to decide which of the faces we want to look upon us. We will continue our studies in Isaiah, tomorrow God willing, where we will look at the seraphim, a continuation of the same vision.